to to Sharon Mullen. Good morning and welcome to this fair housing training supported by funding from the Suffolk County Human Rights Commission. My name is Sharon Mullen and I'm the fair housing educator at the Long Island Housing Partnership. Long Island Housing Partnership is an affordable housing developer that provides homes for low and moderate income families throughout Long Island. LAHP also provides HUD certified housing counseling, down payment assistance and housing rehabilitation programs, as well as fair housing education. <clears throat> um, I, Kathy's been introducing herself, I think. She's our IT person and helps us with all of these trainings. Um, we just couldn't do it without her. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Ms. Andrea Lowe, our presenter for today. Um, Andrea is an attorney at Roman Colfax, a well-known national civil rights law firm. Andrea's litigation practice focuses on eradicating predatory lending and discriminatory housing and lending practices. Um, Andrea has previously worked for Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, so she has a lot of experience in this area, and I definitely look forward to hearing what she has to say. Um, she's going to be talking about fair housing, fair lending, key terminology so that everybody understands the language, um, redlining, lending discrimination, predatory lending, potential fair lending violations, and some of the current hot topics in fair lending. Um, she will take questions at the end, um, so you can put them in the chat or ask them at the end orally. Thank you. Andrea? Thanks. Um, thanks so much for that introduction. Um, and yeah, just I want to thank everyone for being here um, today, uh, you know, kind of being here virtually at least. And um, thank you so much to Sharon, Kathy, and Long Island Housing Partnership for having me. Um, very excited to be um, to be talking to you all about fair lending and to be giving this training. So I'm gonna um, share my screen. Hope that all of the um, Technology happens to be working for me today. You can see it. <laughs> Great, that's what I like to hear. Um, and right, so like um, like Sharon and Kathy have just mentioned, please um, please stay on mute. Although there are a couple of um, activities here where I'll um, solicit some um, participation. If um, I, I would love to have folks participate, if you are willing and able. Um, so, and that can be um, unmuting yourselves and, you know, interacting uh, or, um, you know, typing what re potential responses in, in the chat when we come to those um, exercises. And right, like they mentioned as well, I'm happy to take questions throughout, um, but we will certainly leave time um, at the end for those as well. So I am covering a few different topics today. It's, quite a lot of material. Um, I know that folks on, on the Zoom are from um, a variety of different, um, sort of a variety of different uh, professions and practice settings. So I'm really going to, I'm, I'm gonna try and go over a lot of the fair lending and um, fair housing um, terminology and legal at a bit of a high level. Um, but I will also move on to um, sort of going through some like more granular examples for, for some folks who have more familiarity. But um, I, I did try to, you know, love this to be, um, to, to be inclusive and, and for people with all sorts of different um, knowledge of, of fair lending and fair housing. So we're going to go over redlining, reverse redlining, um, emerging issues, and then I have a few slides on some specific uh, investigative tools, which will be good for um, folks who might be on the advocacy side or the regulatory side. And that can also help folks who are um, who are bankers or, or working on the lending side as well for you know preparing themselves for what um, regulators and advocates um, might be might be thinking about um, particularly with the administration change. Um, I will I can make all of this information also available after the presentation so you don't feel like you know you need to write down all of all of the things on the slides. Um, I'm I'm happy to to circulate the material so so folks can take that home. 
So to get on the same page about um, the, the, the main operative laws that we're talking about. So when we talk about fair housing and fair lending, we're really focusing on the two main federal laws are the Fair Housing Act and the Equal Credit Opportunity Act. Um, Fair Housing Act was really passed to promote the availability of housing to all people, regardless of um, what we refer to as like protected characteristics or prohibited uh, bases when, when we're talking about discrimination. So the Fair Housing Act has several different provisions. I've tried to summarize them here. Um, the, the most important sort of takeaways about what the Fair Housing Act prohibits is that it prohibits um, making unavailable or denying housing. Um, imposing different terms and conditions on housing, um, discriminatory statements, which includes advertising. Um, and there are also separate provisions relating to financing of real estate related transactions, um, and also prohibitions on interference and um, often retaliation on account of someone having um, you know, tried to uh, protect their fair housing rights. And these are the protected um, protected groups that the Fair Housing Act covers. So that's race, color, national origin, religion, sex, which um, HUD has interpreted as including sexual orientation and gender identity, uh, disability, and families with children. ECOA is the um, main fair lending law, Equal Credit Opportunity Act, um, which is implemented by Regulation B. Currently, the CFPB has authority over um, regulatory updates to Regulation B and, um, and putting out guidance um, that which they do from time to time to um, sort of explain some of the regulatory provisions. So ECOA is sort of the complement, the lending equivalent of the Fair Housing Act designed to promote availability of credit um, regardless of um, protected characteristics. Um, ECOA is focused on creditors and lenders, uh, whereas the Fair Housing Act is focused on housing, um, housing providers and, and certain other players in the housing market. And it protects um, discrimination based on race, color, national origin, religion, sex, marital status, age, receipt of public assistance, um, exercising any right under the Consumer Credit Protection Act, which includes um, like some, some sorts of like uh, disputes of uh, credit related information and sexual orientation and gender identity um, now that the CF CFPB just came out with recent guidance about that. Um, regulation B is also important here because in addition to sort of um, codifying and regulatory guidance, most of what ECOA says, it explicitly prohibits um, discouragement um, and, and that ends up being important for some of the um, like potential fair lending causes of action and, um, and practices that have been found to violate fair lending laws. So also want to mention state law um, and where state law fits into all of this. Um, many states have their own anti-discrimination laws that, that would cover banks, housing providers, and other entities who are engaged in housing and lending. And New York is, is certainly one of those, um, one of those states. New York state law does layer on some additional protected classes. So those include military status, um, disability, Fair Housing Act covers disability, but ACOA does not. Um, and New York also prohibits use of criminal history in some circumstances, and that's become uh, much more of a, of, of a hot topic. Um, so, so it's important when considering uh, potential um, for regulators and, and advocates, what, um, what are the potential um, protected classes that New York state law might provide some more protection than federal law. And to uh, know this is, this might be familiar to many of the folks on the call, but I um, want to talk pretty briefly about the two types of discrimination that are uh, prohibited by um, federal anti-discrimination laws, ACOA and the Fair Housing Act. So disparate treatment, or intentional discrimination is prohibited, but also um, there is a, a, a legal test for when something has an unlawful disparate impact and policies that might be business justified, but have a, um, or not business justified, but that have um, a disproportionate adverse impact on a prohibited basis may also be unlawful under these two laws. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, so disparate treatment, is, uh, it's known as intentional discrimination. Um, 
essentially when a creditor treats someone differently on a prohibited basis, that is disparate treatment and that's, um, that's prohibited under these two laws. But disparate treatment isn't, you don't need to, you don't need to prove that someone hates a, pro a protected class or that there's like conscious intent to discriminate. Um, I can, so an example of this would be um, where creditors may have policies about granting like exceptions to like underwriting, um, underwriting system. That is something that because it's so well known um, that this might affect protected groups often on the basis of age or on the basis of race. Um, that is something that regulators have seen historically as potentially disparate treatment, even though a lender might have no intent to, to discriminate and might might not, um, you know, be directly imposing um, something that that affects a protected group. So that, that's something to keep in mind when thinking about this framework. Um, often disparate treatment can be identified by comparing treatment of similarly situated people. Um, and this includes, and this, this is like something that's talked about a lot more now, especially when a lot of lending decisions and even some housing decisions are made because um, due to models. Um, this includes discrimination based on proxy characteristics. So a proxy is essentially a, a variable or a characteristic that closely correlates with a prohibited basis, but isn't exactly using that prohibited basis. Um, so an example, I'm going to say one example of that and then see if um, anyone else has ideas about what would be a prohibited characteristic um, or a, a proxy for a prohibited characteristic. So an example is that um, because of patterns of residential segregation um, that, that we'll talk about in a little bit, we talk more about redlining, um, using really, really detailed like granular geography, such as like the census tract, um, or zip plus four, um, that might be said to be a proxy for race, even though the, the creditor isn't actually using race in their, in their model for underwriting or pricing or advertising. Um, so can anyone think of an, another example of a proxy variable that a creditor might use to discriminate even if, um, even if they're not actually using a protected class in the model? You can feel free to unmute and and tell me if you have an example and guesses are fine. <laughs> How about their employment, where they work? Would that be? That's a that's a really good. I'm sorry, I can like only see a few people at a time, so I'm not sure who shared that response. That's a that's a really good point. That is, um, that is right. And often actually, I, at least I could think of a couple of different um, potential protective characteristics that that correlates with, but you see that often for, um, for sex, for, for men versus women, um, employment in some certain fields, like um, more like early, like early childhood education or, or childcare services. Um, using using that would, could proxy for um, for women versus some um, occupations that are historically more uh, where men are more represented. That's that's a great one. Anyone else? All right. Well, I'm gonna I'll give you some examples and then um, hopefully this maybe this makes more sense. Um, right, so what I said before, um, census tractors at plus four could be a proxy for race. The example shared um, it field of employment and, and type of job could certainly be a proxy potentially for race, certainly for, um, for gender. Um, it can be, especially with a lot of alternate data, alternative data that's available, um, yeah. so something I've seen is interest in certain magazines. So interest in Women's Day magazine or um, offers from Ann Taylor could be a proxy for gender. Um, whether someone is Spanish speaking or limited English proficiency, that could be a proxy for national origin. Um, something that's gotten a lot of press having gone to a historically black college or university, that could also be a proxy for race. So these are just um, you know, some things to look out for 
especially now that data is more complex and some housing providers and lenders have really unprecedented access to a lot of different data on, on borrowers and applicants, um, looking out for all of the potential sneaky ways in which um, lenders might not you know, do it consciously, but that, that um, you know, often they'll put a lot of data into a model and see what's uh, potentially significant. And if, if a proxy, sort of like the general rule of thinking about this is if it isn't intuitive why um, a certain variable might be you know, predictive, like interest in Women's Day magazine or Ebony magazine for race, um, you usually have to scrutinize those pretty carefully to, to make sure that um, the variable isn't really predictive only because of its correlation with a prohibited characteristic. So now that we've talked about um, one way where the Fair Housing Act and Equal Credit Opportunity Act can be violated, um, it can also be violated by um, policies or practices that have discriminatory effects, and that's known as disparate impact liability. So the legal test from Regulation B, which we'll um, sort of talk about as the, as the main standard here, um, is a facially neutral policy that has a disproportionately negative impact on a protected class. Essentially, if there are disparities that result from, um, from any policy or practice, you are at uh, step one of, the, of this um, effects test, this legal test. So then if you are um, the creditor um, or housing provider, um, the, in, in, in case of litigation, the burden would shift to you to, um, to, to make the case for why there's a legitimate business justification for it. Um, but another sub part of this is that they're also responsible, the, the housing provider um, or, or the plaintiff, depending on if this is in litigation, um, would be responsible for, for being able to show us that there's um, a less discriminatory alternative. So it's a in for, for plaintiff side litigation, there is a, a, a burden shifting framework where if you prove that there are discriminatory effects, the burden shifts to defendant to, um, to say that there is a, legi a legitimate business need um, for this policy and the burden shifts back to the plaintiff to um, sort of put forth um, a potential less discriminatory, um, less discriminatory alternative. So it's important to keep in mind here that it is like a three part test it's not just the fact that if there is a um, if there is a disproportionate effect on a prohibited basis that that violates um, ACOA or potentially the Fair Housing Act. The effects test really is is concerned with unnecessary disparities um, and disparities that are not business justified, where there's um, where there might be actually a um, legitimate uh, an alternative um, and when you know we think about cases on the on the plaintiff side um we're sort of looking at disparities that are like statistically and practically significant um it's probably a little too complicated to get into now but um essentially making sure those disparities are not um are statistically significant so it's not just um potentially by chance um and that they're in real world terms meaningful um, that's just terminology to orient us a little bit to the rest of the presentation. I just want to take a few minutes on a couple of slides to show sort of like why, like why we're talking about this and why all of this is important. So I have a few slides on um, housing, wealth, and income disparities among different um, racial and ethnic groups. And these are really just to illustrate sort of the, the, the vastness of this problem. Um, off, these are based on uh, pretty recent, um, in the grand scheme of things, recent data. This, um, this slide that I'm showing now um, shows disparities in net worth um, and, and assets, although I'm you know, focusing your attention on, on the net worth piece. Um, as recently as 2016 between um, non-Hispanic, white, black, and Hispanic families. And you can see those are really immense um, net worth differences these translate into fewer opportun housing opportunities, um, fewer opportunities to get um, access to decent credit. Um, and it really just underscores the importance of talking about um, eradicating discrimination in lending. 
similar um, similar story for home ownership rates. Um, this this graphic is is older, um, but if if I had the updated data, um, these home ownership rates are fairly similar to um, to the current state of affairs with non Hispanic white home ownership um, much much higher at about seventy four percent than um, black and partic particularly black and um, Hispanic households around uh, 44 to 47%. Um, this graphic shows denial rates at, um, as recently as 2017, where I'm focusing your attention. And again, shows that you know, the, the problem isn't just um, you know, access, to, access to credit at all, it's, it's that um, Black and Hispanic folks are disproportionately still denied, um, denied for for credit. So um, here I'm highlighting that the um, denial rates for Black and Hispanic households are almost um, are almost double um, the 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 denial rates for non-Hispanic white households. And again, of course, in this in this moment where I think a, a lot of folks in the country are um, are starting to grapple with some of our, our legacies of um, segregation, um, discrimination, at, at, which at times in our history has been like government mandated, um, Black Lives Matter movement, and um, all these other important social and civil rights movements. There's still a lot of discrimination going on, and, um, and it seems like this is maybe a moment where we can um, make some progress towards um, moving forward and, and eradicating that discrimination. So first, I'm going to talk a little bit about redlining. Um, this redlining has redlining is essentially a practice that was government imposed in the 1930s and 40s, um, and has taken on a few different meanings. So I want to go a bit into some of the history of redlining, and then talk about um, currently um, what the what the framework is, and uh, and talk a little bit more about. Um, um, investigating these practices. So redlining is a, is a practice that violates both the Fair Housing Act and ACOA, and it really refers to refusing to make loans or imposing uh, worse loan terms because of the race, national origin, ethnicity of um, really the area where the property is located. Um, this has been, this practice has been found to violate um, fair housing and fair lending laws um, for, for decades. And based on conversations with some regulators and some advocates um, and, and a lot of news articles that have come out in, in recent years about um, lenders um, still in, avoiding um, certain neighborhoods and lending to, to, to people because of, um, of race and because of the areas where they, um, they're seeking to purchase homes, um, I really expect this to continue to be an area of focus, both for regulators, state and federal level, and for um, advocates and private parties looking to, to bring lawsuits. So um, I'm, this presentation is, I, I think, sort of able to be focused on like regulators and advocates, what investigations you should be doing, but also from the like perspective of lenders um, and folks who are thinking about their compliance systems, what to look for when you're thinking about sort of the, the, the hot topics. And, and one of those is redlining. So I'm just gonna show a few graphics um, pretty quickly. But I'm I'm essentially showing a few maps here of historic redlining, which was which was um, a government instituted practice in the 30s and 40s, where the homeowners loan corporation, which was a government entity, created these maps, essentially drawing areas in red where it said, "Hey, we we won't um, we're not going to lend here. These areas are undesirable," and that was explicitly because of the um, race of people living in those neighborhoods. So here's one of the um, old homeowners loan corporation maps of Brooklyn. And here is one of New Orleans. Um, and now if you look at those areas in red, I'm gonna sh show a few more uh, maps that I think uh, sort of reinforce how the government designating these areas as redlined areas then affect, affects um, current amenities and services. So now here's that map with uh, those red areas now in gray. Here is where public current, um, I think this was made a year or two ago, so mostly current public housing is located. So you can see um, it's being built 
primarily in, um, was built primarily in those redlined areas. You can also see here where bank branches are located. Um, most of those are outside of those redlined areas, which is super important and interesting because it really, it, it just shows the legacy of redlining because as lenders want to locate, um, you know, away from areas that are histor uh, historically redlined and that have a lot of um, ethnic, uh, racial and ethnic minorities, this obviously affects um, access to good credit products for, for those communities. And that was New Orleans, but um, a similar pattern is observed here. These are side-by-side -side maps of um, Indianapolis. So the map on the left, again, the homeowners loan corporation map showing the redlined areas in red. Um, and the map on the right is a dot density map showing the demographics of folks living in those areas um, currently. This is using 2010 data. Um, and as you can see, um, patterns of residential segregation still persist based on, um, based on these, these redlined maps. It becomes very hard to get access um, to credit and for, for folks to be able to actually move into the neighborhoods of their choice, given the legacy of these um, government policies of redlining. So um, redlining has been found to violate both the Fair Housing Act and ACOA. Um, it's sort of an amalgamation, I guess, of, of both of these, of the, of these statutes. Um, it's been found to violate that sort of catch-all provision of the Fair Housing Act that makes it unlawful to otherwise make unavailable or deny um, housing. Also the discriminatory, discriminatory statements provision of the Fair Housing Act because often on redlining cases, one of the primary allegations that there's no outreach um, towards borrowers of color and communities of color um, or at, at, like overtly um, discriminatory statements that would discourage someone from, um, fr from pursuing a loan application. And it also violates um, Equal Credit Opportunity Act. And there's a, a wide variety of people who might be liable under ACOA. Um, ACOA is focused on creditors, um, but creditors include not just the originator of the loan, but it, it, it includes loan officers, bank representatives, mortgage brokers, um, secondary folks who buy in the secondary market, um, people who are a PMI company. So there's a lot of potential players who, who may be implicated in, in potential ACOA issues. I want to sort of highlight that it's not just, um, not only banks who might, might be liable for, uh, not just the direct lender who might be liable for redlining under a COA. Um, redlining cases are typically thought of as disparate treatment cases. Um, essentially, banks are intentionally discriminating against communities of color, but they also may include some disparate impact claims. So, um, uh, I, I actually have a case uh, right now where, where one of the allegations is that the lender's policy of advertising only in areas um, with a branch presence can affect minorities if branches are concentrated in majority, majority non-Hispanic white areas. And um, just kind of to revisit the concept of state law being important here, um, New York's regulators, the AG and the Department of Financial Services have relied um, on New York law in addition to federal law um, to bring a few different redlining suits. Um, so, so state law is also, is also potentially implicated here and certainly New York's anti-discrimination law is violated, um, is violated by, by redlining. These are just a few examples of recent redlining actions in New York. There's also been a few CFPB actions since like the 2015, 2016 um, time frame, but I want to focus on um, these New York actions because, well, I can't say here we are in New York. I'm not in New York, but um, here many of you are in New York. Um, these are three different actions, the first two brought by the AG's office and the third um, settled by New York Department of Financial Services, um, focused on different, different lenders, different, um, different MSAs, but all of them uh, were redlining actions where they ended up with settlements with um, substantial remedial relief to 
um, to uh, essentially the communities who, who have been like starved of credit. We'll talk a little bit more about remedies later, um, but potential remedies for these kinds of um, violations include um, loan subsidy funds so that um, people who are um, Black and Hispanic and, and live in those communities can um, essentially get um, like discounts on loans, pay lower interest rates, get money from lenders to pay PMI. Um, there's, there's a lot of creativity that can go into um, designing remedial relief for, um, for a redlining action. So this slide just highlights a few of those recent cases. If you're, if you're um, a regulator, if you're an advocate and are thinking about how to design, um, potentially design or investigate a redlining case, there's no like checklist. It's it's uh, it's an art, not a science. But um, there are really there are a few sort of like hallmarks of redlining cases, and then a few different pieces of additional evidence that um, that folks like to rely on um, if available. I'm gonna go, and I'm just gonna go through um, those in the subsequent slides. So I'd say the the most important and at least what I see as like the unifying principle in all redlining cases. I've worked on a few at CFPB and have um, worked on a few investigations um, in my current practice. And I've also done this on the, I, I do some counseling work for, for financial institutions as well. So I've also done this from a sort of counseling, um, like looking at risk um, on behalf of lenders. The main hallmark of a redlining case is looking at data and seeing whether the institution has low application and origination volumes in minority areas to minority borrowers and essentially are these institutions outliers. So those would be kind of like three major things. Low volume in minority areas, low volume to minority borrowers, and is it an outlier among peers? Um, peer selection can vary. Um, but typically looking at institutions with a similar loan volume in the, in the geographic area and often similar types of institutions. So obviously there's gonna be different considerations for a large national lender. Um, they might be able to reach a different market than um, super regional uh, lenders. Credit unions may have, do have different regulatory requirements than, um, than um, maybe other types of banks online online non-bank lenders certainly have different types of regulatory requirements than depository institutions. So those are some things to think about if you are considering um, investigating a case, data-driven, looking at peers and looking at outliers. Often uh, regulators, and, and when, when I do this in my practice, like to um, try and get a sense of the evidence graphically. Um, not like it's necessary, but it, it can stand out. So, so here is an example from um, Bancorp South, which was a CFPB case where they mapped um, application volume and um, sort of overlaid on a demographic map. So it's very easy to see um, in this map the extent to which the bank was avoiding um, high minority areas. Their tiny, tiny um, application dots um, in sort of in the uh, higher minority areas and just tons of application volume um, in the lower minority areas. And to illustrate that, I just put together a, a, a little bit of a graphic to show the extent um, for three different redlining cases of, um, it's a little complicated. Um, I was trying to sort of depict here the like extent of disparities in these three different redlining cases, two are CFPB and one is DOJ. So um, I'm showing in the, the rightmost column, the like the, the disparity um, like 4.5 times <laughs> means that in Hudson City, um, peers got 4.5 times the amount of um, applications in high minority census tracts than Hudson City in the New York and um, New Jersey, New York City MSA, and in Camden, um, 31 times the amount of um, applications from high minority tracks. So those, those disparities are useful to, to, again, establish how much of an outlier an institution is. 
Another thing that um, some that regulators and, and some private parties um, like to do is compare um, pricing outcomes and denial disparities. And that's like a humda. That's again an analysis possible using humda data. Um, it might be beyond the scope for for some um, for some like smaller shops, um, but certainly that's what CFPB is going to do, and that's what some of the the bigger regulators are going to do. Is so they're also going to say, hey, um, is there actually are there actually pricing disparities, and are there loan denial disparities? Um, and here's just a few graphics to depict that. Um, Branch locations and assessment areas are also potential sources of, of information on, on potential redlining. So um, seeing whether branches are not located in minority areas and whether banks have sort of carved out of their assessment areas, high minority areas. Um, New York regulators have really focused on, on these provisions um, as part of their redlining cases. And this is important because uh, to level set a little bit, um, Essentially, a bank can designate an assessment area for Community Reinvestment Act purposes, and then it has certain obligations with respect to um, areas in that CRA area. And when you decide as a bank to exclude certain areas from your from your assessment area, you um, you're, you're essentially um, you know not you're not obligated under the CRA to to perform certain activities with respect to those areas. So often regulators will say. Well, are banks excluding high minority areas with um, with respect to CRA? Maybe they don't want to serve those areas, and that was what um, a couple of the New York AG investigations found. Um, so here you're you're seeing that Evans Bank had branch offices and ATMs located completely outside of um, the high high minority central um, city of Buffalo downtown, um, but they're all everywhere else. Um, so that was one of the allegations that they uh, brought to light in, um, in their case against Evans. Um, similarly, you can see CFPB in, in its case against Bancorp South mapped the branch locations all outside of the minority areas. And also Bancorp South had completely carved um, central Memphis, which is all heavily minority, um, out of its assessment area. Similar story here for um, Evans Bank. Some other pieces of information you might want to look at um, in establishing a redlining case are, um, is advertising only going to white areas? Um, is it only using models of non-Hispanic white borrowers? Are people of color not being hired um, to work at this bank? Are there no loan officers who are, are um, people of color? Are partnerships with brokers only serving the white community? These have all been um, different um, different pieces of evidence that have been used in redlining cases. Um, some housing groups and regulators have also um, conducted testing of lenders and um, essentially looked for entities that provide less information to um, a Black borrower versus a non-Hispanic white borrower. Um, sometimes there's steering that can take place where um, black borrowers are only told about certain loan products and non-Hispanic white borrowers are, are um, given a much a wider range of options and much more assistance. Um, these are often, I, I think of these, these are like useful supplemental evidence um, for your potential redlining case. And on the compliance side, on the, on the lender side, these are all things that you'd want to look for internally um, to, to make sure that, um, that, that you're advertising is reaching communities of color in a wide audience and is reflecting the diversity of, of applicants you want to bring in the door, that you're partnering with brokers who serve um, potentially um, immigrant communities, Sp Spanish-speaking communities. Um, I tell lenders sometimes to consider conducting their own internal testing um, to, to ensure that it isn't the case that borrowers are being provided with different information um, based on their race or other protected characteristics. This is another, uh, I like maps. Um, this is showing that uh, th this was a lender who generated most of its business through brokers. Um, and this is a map from the CFPB complaint showing that it had broker relationships really with brokers who only served the, um, the, the non-communities of color. So um, 
that is another thing to look for. Like it's, it's not that you're not potentially liable, even if you're generating business from third parties, you really have to look carefully at those relationships. Like I mentioned before, potentially there's a lot of creativity in designing relief um, for, for one of these um, settlements or, or, or cases if, if you go you know, further along in the case. Um, it's often hard to identify who's affected by redlining, right? It's, it's very different from having a case where I say my client was discriminated against um, because they looked for an apartment and they were told it wasn't available because, um, because they're black or because they have children. But here, often that monetary relief looks like a loan subsidy program. Like I talked about earlier, you might decide, um, you know, in connection with the bank as part of a settlement that you would like uh, money for interest rate reductions, down payment or closing cost assistance, or um, lender paid PMI. And that can make a really big difference in um, actually having communities of color be able to, to access um, these products at a more on more favorable terms. Um, often these settlements come with spending for consumer education, community partnerships, such as with, um, with fair housing groups to do, um, to, to sort of, to, to engage, um, to increasingly engage with different communities, um, spending on affirmative marketing and outreach. And sometimes the, the, for, for regulators, they can get civil money penalties as part of these settlements. Um, policy changes are also really important and are, are always implemented as, in some way as part of redlining settlements. Those in, often include getting new branches and loan production offices in high minority areas, which really helps to increase access um, for these communities, um, for entities who don't have or have kind of deficient compliance and training plans. Often these settlements help to um, make those more robust. Um, sometimes there will be policy changes in terms of hiring. Um, there will be fair lending officers if, if a bank hasn't had them previously, or there will be more um, specific terms around how, uh, how hiring should look and specifically to, um, to hire people who um, are going to be focused on these issues going forward. All right, so I know I'm kind of going through a lot of material and that was a lot. Um, but it's a nice segue to talk about from redlining to talk about reverse redlining or um, predatory lending. Where redlining is focused on, hey, you have these responsible credit products and you, the lender, um, are, not, are not making them equally available to all people and to all geographic areas, you're starving. Um, areas with, high, with higher minority concentrations of these good credit products. Reverse redlining is essentially the opposite. Um, it is focused on lenders who have bad credit products and are actually targeting um, borrowers of color and minority communities for these bad products because of race, ethnicity, national origin. Um, and so essentially in reverse redlining cases, you, are, you have to establish two things, that there's a predatory product being offered and it is being targeted um, on a prohibited basis or had a disparate impact on a prohibited basis. Um, so yes, this handy graphic shows that there really these are flip sides of the same coin and the same statutes are applicable to reverse redlining claims. So here that's um, the same two federal laws we've been talking about and the New York human rights law. If, if you as an advocate or a regulator have, um, have gotten complaints about um, some lenders making predatory, um, making predatory loans or just want to initiate your own investigations, you're really looking at two things. So is a product predatory and is it discriminatory? When we're talking about products that are predatory, um, I, I like to think about it in terms of like what you want an expert to establish versus what um, potentially borrowers or affected, affected people can establish. So I, and I have a reverse redlining case right now um, where we have um, had an expert to talk about essentially like why this is, why these products are predatory. Um, 
So some of those examples of what, what an expert can help to establish as predatory is like high interest rates, um, terms that a borrower cannot afford, um, unfair terms like balloon payments, prepayment penalties, arbitration clauses, um, and including unnecessary products in, in, um, in the agreement. But the potentially affected parties can also talk about why tactics are, are predatory. Um, often witnesses will talk more about tactics, whereas an, you might want an expert to talk about sort of why the, the term itself is predatory. But um, people who have been affected by these practices can talk about how they were told, they were misrepresented um, information about their loan as part of the process, that the lender didn't disclose fees or terms, maybe they didn't have an opportunity to review documents. Um, something that has come up in, in the case I am litigating is loan documents are only provided in English, but this product is um, targeted towards um, Spanish speaking communities. Um, and if there's a right of rescission under Truth in Lending Act or other state law that the, the lender hasn't advised about that. And when you're thinking about whether something's discriminatory, that, that a predatory product is discriminatory, um, really you're looking to, to see if it seems like it's being targeted towards minority communities. So experts might be able to, to analyze media expenditures to see whether um, really the lender is only focusing these products on, on um, communities of color and borrowers of color. They also can conduct statistical and mapping analyses of where loans are going or where loans are have worse terms. Like sometimes predatory lending cases can actually be brought against lenders who might have like good products, um, which are mostly being targeted towards non-Hispanic white communities and bad products, which are mostly being targeted towards communities of color. So differentiating those via statistics and mapping uh, would be important. And often um, witnesses can talk very well about why, why they think the product is discriminatory and has been targeted on, uh, on a discriminatory basis. That usually includes testimony like um, how they found out about the company and the product, um, family, family and uh, friends who have um, got products from the same lender because the lender is really only operating in those communities and other evidence of, of discrimination that, that, might be, um, that might come well from, from them because they have interactions with the lender and the staff and you know, um, might have additional information. So I'm gonna talk quickly about a case uh, my firm has, has litigated and then we'll do a, a little bit of a group exercise. So um, my firm litigated a case called Emigrant, um, which I featured because it's uh, in New York. Um, the plaintiffs were eight African-American and Hispanic borrowers who had been um, given these uh, predatory loans from, from Emigrant. Emigrant is a, a bank and a mortgage company who had sort of like better credit products that were targeted towards non-Hispanic white communities, and also this predatory refinance product that was targeted towards the African-American and Hispanic community. And so this was um, a, a little bit around the time of the financial crisis, but pre-crash. Um, emigrant was targeting African-American communities for um, loans where no documentation was required, um, where loans were based solely on the value of value and not the borrower's ability to repay. If the borrower missed the borrower payment, um, an 18% default interest rate was imposed. And that, um, that was not disclosed to borrowers and was found to be predatory. And uh, there were two different trials um, for complicated reasons, but the jury ended up finding for plaintiffs that emigrants loan program was predatory and discriminatory. And we should ask that one. Okay, sorry, I see stuff in the chat that I've been missing. Um, I'm going to play a video real quick and then I will look at the chat. So, 
No more, no more. No more, no more. No more. Okay. Um, so that was just a, I just want to introduce briefly one of the plaintiffs from the emigrant case, show what happened to him um, losing his home to a foreclosure. And that only because of um, this, this case that my firm and Brooklyn Legal Services brought was he able to um, to get any um, get get any relief, and you know, for a lot of borrowers, unfortunately, that's that's not the case. Sorry, I'm looking at um, I'm looking at a couple of the chats. Okay, um, I'm sorry because. I think some of these I should have addressed earlier. Okay, someone asks where I can where you can get comparator data from if you're if you're trying to develop a redlining case. Um, I would look primarily at the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act data. That is what institutions have to submit to CFPB if they meet certain um, certain thresholds for their for their loans. And um, so most most institutions who are major institutions um, have to have to submit. Um, Humda data, and there you actually, what you can do is often um, you'll look at an, um, a metropolitan area or an MSA where, um, where the lender you are focused on is doing business, and you'll be able to essentially get a list of other lenders' data who are also active in, um, in, that, in that MSA and be able to, um, to like download like a spreadsheet of, um, of that data and look at who has similar loan volume and who has, who's doing more loans in um, to, to uh, Black or Hispanic borrowers and in those communities. So it's, um, it's definitely a bit of a complicated process and you need some, some folks who are data sa savvy, um, but it's, it's certainly possible even for, um, you know, people who, uh, you know, don't do this pr uh, pr primarily. There was another question that now I'm struggling to pull up, but I will, uh, I will get to it at the end. <laughs> Andrea, I'll read it for you. It's Thank how, you. Can, how can someone have their loan or mortgage evaluated for a potential predatory loan? That's a great question. Um, how some of these cases have come to, to me and to my law firm is that someone actually like go, goes to a fair housing center operating in their area who, who will um, sometimes have in-house expertise to be able to evaluate their loan. Um, they might consult with outside lawyers such as, such as my law firm or some, some national nonprofits, Center for Responsible Lending. Um, but so I would say for like, individual people who suspect that they might be discriminated against to, to try and reach out to fair housing groups in their area, um, there's no like mechanical checklist for what is predatory. So, so I'm like struggling a little bit with that aspect of the question. It's, it's like a, like a pretty, like you have to take a pretty holistic look at sort of everything that was involved. So that sort of involves the interest rate, um, the terms of the loan, 
uh, the process for getting the loan and signing the documents, if there was, were any misrepresentations or um, things that they thought about the transaction that turned out not to be true. Um, but similar to what I've talked about with here for immigrant, um, were there terms, if the borrower fell behind one payment, were, were different, much more onerous terms imposed that weren't disclosed to the borrower? Um, did the lender work with the borrower at all during, um, if, if the borrower did fall behind? Those are all things I would look at, but often a fair housing group would have at least some sort of expertise to be able to try and assist someone who suspects they may have been the victim of discrimination. So I wanna do a quick, quick uh, group exercise. Um, as I've talked about, um, one of the central Thing, uh, themes in Emigrant, um, how, how the team went about establishing discrimination, was that Emigrant was targeting um, African Americans for this bad loan product by publishing ads in newspapers like the Afro-American Times, Caribbean Life, um, that served these communities in New York City. Um, so this is an example of advertising that targets um, a marginalized um, class of people who often are um, sort of denied credit by, um, by lenders. I want you all to think about you know, target advertisements that you see you know, every day, online, in the mail, walking down the street. Um, can you think or, or share any examples of like techniques advertisers use, um, targeted ads that you've seen in your daily life? It doesn't have to be. Um, it, it can be discriminatory, it can be not discriminatory. I, I'm, I sort of like want to hear if, if you have, um, can extrapolate from this example thoughts on now what you might be able to recognize as like advertising that targets um, a particular group of people. Does anyone have um, thoughts they like to share on that? And feel free to unmute. Oh, that ad's calling for affordable housing. Yes, that's a, that's a great example. Anyone else? I've seen ads where they show a house and a piggy bank and money going into the piggy bank or from the house, vice versa, very kind of friendly community type things, your house is a piggy bank. And that kind of is very discriminatory and sends a wrong message. Yes, absolutely. Um, and that that also, right, the, those are some of the, the practices that led to, to, you know, to the immigrant case, people who, who um, owned their homes already and were sort of essentially like misrepresented to by lenders that um, get these great affordable home loans that turned out to be completely unaffordable and only good for the lender. So that's, that's another great example. Something that I've seen before and I think is, is fairly subtle is housing that, that um, says, you know, it's for young professionals. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think you know, that's that's the sort of advertising that I think some <laughs> housing providers are savvy enough to stay away from at this point. But 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 to others, they you know they don't see what's wrong with that. They they think oh you know young professionals like it's just a, a group of people. But you know there's nothing about race or you know anything in it. But um, that might say something about um, the race of people who's just preferred. It definitely says something about um, just preferring families with children. To something that, that um, I've seen a lot of complaints of and, and, it, and continues to be a huge issue. That was great. Thank you for sharing. I'm going to go fairly quickly through some emerging issues that um, I know based on talking with regulators and advocates are some of the, the, the most, um, some of the, the pressing issues that continue to um, continue to be issues in the lend fair lending space and that uh, advocates and regulators want to focus on in the next few years. So I'm, I'm really trying to do a quick overview of each topic for, for general awareness, but um, then happy to take more questions. So the first one I want to talk about is maternity and parental leave discrimination, which even though it's 
probably been on the emerging issues list for 10 years, um, still continues to be in my practice um, on the litigation side, something we continue to get complaints in about. Um, so essentially, it's very clear um, at this point <laughs> from regulators, from Fannie and Freddie, that um, you can't discriminate because a borrower is on parental leave and income received while a borrower is on leave is not to be treated differently from any other sources of income. However, um, I continue to see examples of the following that, that persist even from sophisticated lenders. So I've seen banks refusing to approve loans if borrowers are on parental leave, approving for lower loan amounts because someone's on parental leave, requiring borrowers to return to work in order to close on a loan, and borrowers who experience some discriminatory statements about sort of plans to return to work um, after leave. And all of these things violate the Fair Housing Act and the Equal Credit Opportunity Act and potentially state law as well. But um, I continue to, to see those complaints. So to sort of insert like a recommended compliance step for anyone who's on the lender or compliance side, um, it's really important to make clear that to ensure that employees are trained on dealing with these situations. We continue to see that employees um, actually sometimes just, so sometimes it's, it's really not intentional. They don't know what to do if someone's going to be on leave. And um, having employees to be being trained on these issues is, is extremely important. I would also recommend monitoring loan, um, loan applications and inquiries um, for keywords like pregnancy and leave, um, temporary leave as, as part of ongoing fair lending monitoring and risk monitoring, and really just making sure that residential underwriting guidelines incorporate um, the, the guidance from um, Fannie Mae on how temporary income should be calculated and making sure that um, all the guidelines are clear that just because you're on leave does not mean that you cannot uh, close on your mortgage loan. Continue to see that all the time. Another issue I wanna talk about is um, limited English proficiency. So um, this, this has become, this continues to be an, an important topic for, for lenders thinking about how, how much in language they need to um, make available and market um, and sort of uh, potential discrimination issues with LEP. HUD has, um, has put out guidance that says essentially um, LEP is not the same as national origin, which is uh, can't discriminate um, on the basis of national origin under fair housing and fair lending laws, but HUD has specifically said LEP is closely linked with certain race and national origin groups. So if you're restricting housing based on LEP status, that might um, create a disparate impact, which um, could violate the FHA. Another thing to think about when you're considering limited English proficiency issues is the potential for creating unfair, deceptive, and abusive acts or practices UDAPs, which are, um, you know, regulators can enforce this prohibition under federal law and often, um, and, and states have, um, states, often state laws include um, similar provisions. So that is essentially, it's a little similar to reverse redlining, essentially making sure that there's not sort of a bait and switch going on where lenders are um, doing a lot in language to attract Spanish speaking um, or uh, um, non-English speaking customers, but then making sh but then not having other key parts of the lending journey in language. Actually gonna skip these ex this exercise um, because I wanna leave time for questions, but essentially um, I'm just laying out in this slide what regulators and advocates should look for um, if, if you receive a complaint or just become, suspect based on you know, things you've heard or, or news stories um, of lenders and providers who might not be serving LEP individuals. So things that I look for in my investigations would be um, lack of translation services. If, uh, especially for banks and lenders who are located in areas in or adjacent to heavily Spanish speaking areas, do they not have any in-house translation? Um, would they not use language line if, um, if, if a borrower came in who's not English speaking? Access to translation services in some form is, is, is fairly important for, for lenders to, to implement. 
Lack of translated documents and disclosures, especially if those products are advertised in Spanish or, um, or in another language is, is also extremely important. Um, it's, you know, it's not mandated by fair lending law that everything is translated, but there are cert but certainly if something is um, advertised in Spanish, I would expect the application, the borrower agreement, truth and lending disclosures and adverse action notices to also be in Spanish. Similar to my first bullet, um, making sure that Spanish speakers are supported during loss mitigation and collections efforts. Um, and if, if uh, right, if uh, lenders are like aggressively advertising in language, really making sure that um, as much of the customer journey as possible is, is also in Spanish or, or other non-English languages that the advertising is, is in. I, I just have a few slides on machine learning and use of models. It's a very technical topic um, that I just wanted to touch on and, and more just make folks aware of some of the issues that can, um, that can exist around this issue. Essentially, um, models are now being used for so many more decisions than they ever used to be. So for like simple lending decisions, for some, even for some housing providers to be doing like tenant screening. Um, and there are actually, I think a lot of people know about potential bad things that come with use of AI and machine learning, but there are some good things as well. Um, so machine learning is essentially a modeling technique. An algorithm learns from the data. It doesn't, um, uh, it, without a model or necessarily doing anything, the, the, the algorithm learns itself based on the data it's getting. So, there are actually some good things that can come of this. It's a it's a fairly cheap um, model building technique, and that and so that's good in terms of access to credit. Um, it's essentially freeing up resources for lenders to be able to um, to devote to things like um, you know increased credit. It's also capturing complexity, which allows for potentially greater accuracy, and that can expand credit access as well. If banks were unwilling to take on risks previously because algorithms could only be so accurate, machine learning is going to um, increase accuracy and potentially then expand credit access. However, there's certainly a lot of issues that come with these algorithms. Um, often it, it can be difficult to interpret what the model is actually doing and that um, makes it all the more important that um, whoever at the bank or a third party is, is actually overseeing this algorithm is, is really um, keeping on top of what it's doing, making sure that traits that are in the model are not proxying for a prohibited basis, and making sure that credit decisions are explainable, which is important for um, fair lending compliance, like generating adverse action notices. And it doesn't matter it's a, if it's a model, um, just like any other non-machine learning model or lending decision, these models are subject to fair lending laws and should be examined for prohibited bases or proxies. And similar to what we discussed before, um, you can still have potential discriminatory treatment or disparate impact from using models. So um, something that we continue to see, which we talked about before is, is proxy variables. Machine learning models often use a ton of data and it's pretty important to, to be scrutinizing the inputs very closely to make sure that you don't have potential proxy in your model. Um, models can also result in a disparate impact. Um, the core logic litigation is, is an example of the use of criminal history in, in tenant screening that raises these concerns and HUD has put out guidance on this issue. So really my sort of three best practices and things to keep in mind are um, watch out for what models and data are being made available and how they're being used. If you are um, a vendor or, um, or considering a partnership with creditors, really ask hard questions about some of the models they use and techniques they use to look for proxies and test for disparate impact. And if you are a lender and you are using models, keep in mind that you should be looking for less discriminatory alternatives, especially for models used for um, customer facing decisions, as well as advertising and marketing. Um, a couple other issues that I want to touch on, low income housing tax credit issues. Um, the Fair Housing Act applies to low income housing tax credit. 
properties, and there's a, a few different ways in which um, discrimination can occur um, in financing, siting, and renting out units in LIHTC properties. Um, so essentially, my things to look out for, um, if, especially if you're at, at a housing group or, um, or are receiving complaints from the public, um, lenders who are, are being looked to for external financing, lenders must comply with the Fair Housing Act and lending decisions related to these properties, and they cannot just exclude these properties from, um, from, um, from credit. In citing these properties, citizens often may express opposition to tax credit properties that often have to do with race and ethnicity and familial status. And those are those are potentially um, issues of discrimination under the Fair Housing Act. In terms of renting out units in these properties, um, providers have to accept voucher holders and comply with all of the Fair Housing Act anti-discrimination provisions, which includes accessibility to persons with disabilities. Um, for LGBTQ plus discrimination, that is um, now an increasingly um, big area of focus for regulators. The CFPB has issued interpretive guidance, um, cl just clearly stating that the Equal Credit Opportunity Act pro prohibits discrimination based on gender identity and sexual orientation discrimination. It's also a state stated White House priority area, and there's potential for um, sexual orientation to be added to HMDA, which would allow folks to be able to test for discrimination um, in a data-driven way. Um, and there, there may be explicit amendment of um, the Equal Credit Opportunity Act to, to include sexual orientation and gender identity. And even though lenders continue, I think, to think that, that they have a handle on these issues. There's still been a lot of studies that show that um, LGBTQ plus customers continue to face a ton of discrimination in lending, um, both in terms of customer experience. Um, there's been a, a study about individuals whose name or gender presentation doesn't match ID, and a third of them reported at a minimum harassment and at a maximum um, physical violence or denial of service. And other studies show that LGBTQ plus customers um, continue to pay higher interest rates and closing costs and experience higher denial rates, making this um, uh, increased priority area for regulators and for um, advocates. So two strategies that regulators and advocates can use in identifying potential discrimination would be mystery shopping. We talked about this a bit before. Testers can pose as applicants for credit or, um, or banking services and um, and see whether there's differential level of services provided based on perceived um, sexual orientation or gender identity. And some, um, some regulators have um, talked about doing quantitative analyses, which looking at HMDA data compare same sex joint applicants for credit um, with joint opposite sex applicants for credit. It's, um, it's not completely capturing sexual orientation, but it's often able to sort of proxy for at least what um, loan officers um, might identify um, couples as. And the last um, quick emerging, uh, continue to, to be emerging issue I'm gonna talk about is physical accessibility um, under the ADA and the Fair Housing Act. Um, we continue to see complaints about uh, physical accessibility to lenders and bank branches as well, um, as well as um, issues related to website accessibility. So um, the ADA um, imposes physical accessibility requirements, among other things, on physical bank branches and really mandates that bank branches have to provide equal opportunity to participate in goods and services. Um, you can't fail to permit service animals lenders have to make banking terminals and ATMs accessible, and the, the onus cannot be on persons with disabilities to pay for stuff like auxiliary aids and barrier removal, because that is um, that would be deemed to be a reasonable modification that um, where the, the um, sort of onus is on, on the bank to provide um, those accommodations. So here are a few best practices for bank branches and housing providers. Um, and again, I, I think a lot of these are obvious, but they, they continue to be, to be issues that we see and are raised in studies. Um, even recently, there have been settlements for bank branches that don't accept video relay calls. So, so making sure that 
um, video relay and all services used by deaf customers are accepted means of communication from banks, um, permitting service animals, offering large print and braille materials. Um, my law firm recently filed a lawsuit against a housing provider who engaged in some of these, these um, no-no practices. <laughs> so housing providers really need to make sure that designated parking spaces are available, first floor units and units that are ex with accessible features are available, and make reasonable, um, reasonable accommodations for people with disabilities, like waiving fees for first floor units. Again, these continue to be issues, even though they might seem obvious. Um, I just have a few slides on fair lending investigations that we've mostly gone over already. So I am um, going to open it up for questions. We have about 10 minutes left. So I, I hope that's enough time for questions and I hope I didn't bore everyone too much. <laughs> Thank you, Andrea. Do we have any questions coming in? I got well, okay. I got um, a direct message that says, "Could a requirement of a minimum credit score be considered to have a disparate impact?" Um, that is very, <laughs> that's very tricky. Um, the The answer to that is definitely. However, um, it because the disparate impact test takes into account business justification, it's going to be really difficult for, FICO at this point is very accepted for a lot of decision making. It really depends what the minimum credit score requirement is used for. Um, so I, I would say that. I think at this point, um, minimum credit score used for like mortgage underwriting and pricing, for example, you this probably has a disparate um, adverse impact on the basis of, um, of race and potentially some other prohibited um, bases, but you're gonna have a hard time as a potential plaintiff or regulator showing what the um, alternative is. For some, I've definitely, I've seen FICO potent like potentially used for stuff like, um, Advertising, for example, that I would say is is a, is definitely an issue because why would you like why would you be doing that for a for a large range of products and, unless the minimum unless the minimum score is like very low you really shouldn't be imposing like you definitely shouldn't be imposing a stricter um, FICO minimum for advertising on than what you would take for uh, for underwriting a loan for example so it's a complicated question it definitely may and, and probably does have um, an adverse impact on the basis of race. A lot have been written about the discrimination of FICO scores. Um, and I, I think as more data goes into alternative credit scoring models, there might be opportunity to challenge credit scoring. But at this point, FICO, if it's used for underwriting or pricing, it's going to be, um, I'm not going to say it's impossible, but it's, it's, uh, uh, it's going to be you have a lot of barriers to, to being able to say what the less discriminatory alternative is to using FICO. It's possible though. Andrea, another question was, can a seller or seller's agent say they will not take an FHA loan? Uh, I wanna ask some people from my firm about that. I, I that, that would surprise me if that's, um, it surprises me that someone wouldn't want to. Um, I that's tough because that's not so taking an FHA loan. That's not directly um, you know discrimination, right? There's there's no direct prohibited uh, basis being used for for making that statement. But it's certainly um, but FHA loans are certainly used by folks of of different demographics and certainly lower income folks more generally. I. I would be hard pressed to say that absent other information that that is like overtly discriminatory, but um, but I wouldn't be surprised if someone says that who engages in other discriminatory practices as well. So I think in that instance, I like I would probably want to find out from them maybe some more information about why. Um, but but absent other information, it might not be. It might, that's probably not a Fair Housing Act violation and. The, the corollary of that 
is that I actually work with some lenders who don't take FHA, who don't um, do FHA loans. And that it's, and that's something that my firm has worked on a lot. That by itself, again, is not a problem as long as the bank is very aware that they are um, offering maybe even more beneficial products than FHA. Like FHA is, is, a, is, is not necessarily the best product out there, right? Um, if banks can come up with other products that are even more beneficial, that might um, benefit lower income folks um, and maybe communities of color. So um, again, I probably want to know a little bit more about that, but that's, um, yeah, hopefully that was helpful. I've gotten a few questions about obtaining the materials, which I, um, I'll probably put into a PDF and can send um, to folks at LIHP to send around. Oh, okay. Kathy is chatting about it. Um, <laughs> great. We have a few minutes and I don't think I've seen any other questions in the chat. So um, do other folks have questions? You can um, you can unmute or or chat. I'm now actively looking at it. Does zoning issues ever come into play with regard to um, lenders or um, sellers of uh, residential houses uh, using zoning to keep out minorities and, and others? Yeah, definitely. Um, those zoning issues, at least, um, at least in my practice so far, we, we tend to treat some of the zoning, potential zoning issues being used to, um, to, to keep like lower income folks and folks of color out of certain neighborhoods. That's also zoning comes into play when people are talking about siting like group homes or residential treatment facilities, um, other homes where people with disabilities may, lead to, may live together. Those are often, at least, at least when I've come across them, cases where depending on the zoning um, ordinances that are being deployed, we have sued municipalities um, for potential um, Fair Housing Act and sometimes um, ADA violations because of uh, using zoning in a, in a discriminatory way. I have not come across situations where that um, is more of a lending issue, um, if that makes sense. Although. I can, I can certainly see, and some of the presentation with respect to the low income housing tax credit properties, you can, you can see how those issues might be, might be related, but typically those are being used by municipalities um, to keep kinds of, certain kinds of housing out and it, it's a bit less of a financing issue. Any other questions? Um, I have a question. Do, uh, would individuals have the ability to basically uh, send testers to lenders um, to determine if there's some pattern of uh, disparate treatment? Yeah, great question. Testing is... Um, there, there are fairly well-developed methodologies for doing testing um, that typically I would recommend seeking the aid of a fair housing group who engages in this kind of work. And, and I think there are actually a few in the, in the New York area doing, doing this kind of testing. I say that because when we test for intentional discrimination, um, there's usually a process called matched pair testing where testers get these, um, the assumed identities and, and essentially identical financial and other profiles. And it's the protected class tester um, that can be um, a, a black tester, um, someone who is a, a single mother with, with children if you're testing for familial status discrimination. Um, and that person just has like slightly better, usually like FICO or um, annual income or maybe both. And that the matched pair setup really enables uh, you as the individual or the group or the regulator to, to be able to make the case that you, you took these two people and the only thing that was different was that the protected class person was actually a better candidate and they still were discriminated against. Um, that is why, and, and there's like a, um, it's like a fairly tech, 
I don't want to say technical, but, but there's like a process for like training testers and what information they can and cannot give um, and making sure that certain requirements are met. That being said, I definitely encountered um, individuals thinking that that they have been discriminated against who sort of like conducted their own testing. Um, I think an example of this is some of the recent appraisal cases where essentially a person has said, I think my house was appraised at a discriminatorily low amount because like I was home and I, I am a, a black person and I wanna see if, um, if my neighbor is there when the appraiser comes and my neighbor is uh, a, a white presenting person if there's a difference and then that, that appraisal comes in $70,000 higher and then um, there, there have been a few HUD complaints and a, a, at least one public settlement. That is sort of what I think of as like, you can do sort of like more like ad hoc your own testing. Um, it's obviously a little unconventional, but those are definitely things I consider if like I'm doing an intake and, and someone's done that sort of work. I probably still wanna do some mash pair testing, but that, but, but, your individual testing um, you know, can help establish discrimination, but for something like, I wanna go into a bank and see if two people are treated differently, I definitely recommend doing the, um, engaging the services of a group who, who is familiar with uh, the framework. Thank you. And we, we have two groups here that do that um, regularly, Fair Housing Justice Center and Long Island Housing Services. Oh, that's great. That's great to know, thank you. Well, thank you, Andrea. I think we're out of time and I wanna thank you very much for the presentation. Um, Kathy has let us know and she put it in the chat that these uh, seminars that we've been doing and there's quite a few of them training on fair housing and now fair lending will be available um, on the YouTube channel for LAHP later in the week or maybe early next week. Um, and I wanna thank all of the participants today and please feel free to follow up if you have any other questions. Um, we'll be doing more fair housing training as we go along. Um, I think I might take a month off from all of these, uh, but um, you know we've been we've been very busy. We've done quite a few. Um, we did plan because source of income is such a major issue in New York State to have New York State come back and do another very focused training on source of income. Particularly because we have the we have the um, emergency assistance rental program, um, and we are beginning to hear reports of landlords who don't want to accept that. Um, and of course, that would be lawful source of income. So um, we'd like to have the state come and, and perhaps do a training specifically for landlords. Um, in terms of their obligations. But, and I was so happy to hear you say about um, young professionals, because that's one of the things that I say to developers all the time. No, we should not be advertising to young professionals. They are not a protected group. <laughs> it continues to be, it continues to be such an issue. Yeah, um, well, empty nesters is the other one. And, oh, wow. And, yeah, yeah. Andrea put her um, her email address into the chat. If anybody has any follow up questions, it's a low at r e l m a n l a w dot com. Okay, so thanks thank, again. Thank you so thank you so much, everyone, for joining and LAHP for coordinating. Great. Thank you all. Bye bye now. Bye. Have a good one.